Are we um let's see. It's making a sound. Or do you have no, but it's making a sound. It's feedback. So you want me to the zoom is feedback. It's giving feedback. But it's giving feedback. It's giving feedback to the media. So do I have to turn off my mm -hmm. Good morning. I'm sorry, we're just having a little little technical difficulties real quick. All right. No, it's here. All right. All right. I would like to welcome you, the students and science and math teachers visiting in person and virtually to our, I'm sorry. All right, thank you. All right, I'm gonna start that again. I'm sorry I had echoes up here. But good morning. I would like to welcome the students in science and math teachers and educators visiting in person and virtually to our Louisiana State University Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory Physics and Astronomy Demos Program. It's a mouthful, known as LLPAD. I am Vernita Atkins, the program manager. We, the staff of LLPAD, would like to welcome you, the students and teachers, to our science talk with Dr. Anthony Johnson. LLPAD strives to provide programs like this, bringing elite scientists to speak to our middle and high school math and science educators and their students. This program, as well as other programs of LLPAD, is funded by the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation. Before, during, and after the program, we have LIGO Livingston personnel, LSU physics and astronomy, I mean, and astronomy grad students, and so University LIGO docents that are available for you around the area. They have been assisting you. So if you need any assistance, they are around. You'll just look for the, polo sh the LIGO polo shirt. Without further ado, I would like to welcome to the stage LSU's very own professor and LOPAD's principal investigator, Dr. Gabrielle Gonzalez, to introduce our speaker for the day. Hello. Hello, and welcome to LSU. I know that you are all excited about science, so I'll make it short. I, am, I greeted many of you. I'm Gabby, Gabriela Gonzalez. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy here at LSU. I do research on LIGO. So sometimes I see me or my students who are also around here um, working at LIGO. But today I'm here to tell you about our speaker, Professor Anthony Johnson. He was a member of the technical staff at AT&T Bell, AT&T. The phone company, you know, they have scientists on staff and they do very good work. So he worked there at AT&T Bell Laboratories uh, for many years before going to the New Jersey Institute of Technology. There he was the chairperson and distinguished professor, but after that he moved again to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He is now the director uh, of the Center for Advanced Studies in Photonics Research. So I hope he tells us something about this photonics research, which is very exciting. His research includes the ultra fast physics and nonlinear optics. It all sounds very difficult, but he may explain some of that, <laughs> um, especially for ultra short pulse propagations. That topic is a very, very hot topic in physics. In fact, that was a topic of the last Nobel Prize this year in 2023. He was in 2002, the president of the Optical Society of America. That's a big, big society where everybody doing optics in the US and abroad gathered to share research. He was 
and still is, I think, the only African American president uh, ever of that society. So I am a member of that society too, and I'm very proud of that. He has been, his research and he himself has been recognized by many, many different institutions. And I had the list in here because I, know, I knew I was going to forget some. He has been elected as a fellow by the Optical Society of America that I mentioned, by the National Society of Black Physicists, by the American Physical Society, the Institute of Electrical and in Electronics Engineer, uh, by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and by the very, very prestigious in the US, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. That was the last award a few years ago. So we are really, really very honored to introduce to you Professor Anthony Johnson. Do I need this? No. Well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, quite a pleasure to be to see this audience of our future scientists, future physicists, future chemists, mathematicians. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here. And I want to thank uh, Drs. Gabriela Gonzalez and Dr. Jorge Pullen for inviting me to take part. Uh, in this uh, event. And um, I had the opportunity to visit LIGO yesterday. Um, Dr. Pullen uh, gave me a, a tour. And it was really interesting for me because I teach a course at uh, UMBC uh, on modern optics. And one of, the, one of my lectures is on interferometers and of course LIGO. And so to get to actually see it, was quite impressive. And now I can brag to my students that I've actually been to LIGO. Um, and very impressive uh, unit. So um, I've been uh, asked to talk a bit about how I got to where I am today, uh, what my history was and, and so forth. And not so much on the physics, though I have a few slides at the end talking about some of the things going on in in my lab, but right now it's mostly talking about uh, my journey. How did I get here? And so I have to start at the beginning. And this is, this is my high school yearbook. I went to high school in Brooklyn, New York. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. And in my high school, school yearbook, I actually listed my desire to be a physicist. And that happened because of an incredible physics high school teacher that took me under his wing and, and somehow knew that I was really excited about the physics. And so excited that I even went to his alma mater to get my bachelor's degree in physics at the Polytechnic Institute of New York. All my education is in, is in uh, New York. But I knew I wanted to be a physicist, but I didn't know how far I wanted to go. And what would I be doing as a physicist? And that's when I got lucky enough to hear about Bell Labs, AT&T Bell Laboratories, where Bell is, of course, after Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. And Bell Labs is the research arm of AT&T. And so one of the things that I was able to do was take part in a very unique program called the Cooperative Research Fellowship Program for Minorities. And so this program was founded in 1972, well before many of you were born. Um, and it was one of the first programs of its kind in the US to address the issues of underrepresentation of minorities at the PhD level in the fields of math, science, and engineering, the STEM fields. And then two years later, they founded a program called the Graduate Research Program for Women, 
GRPW in 74, a companion program to the CRP program. And this was to address the shortage of women scientists at Bell Labs. And so, but to create a pool of undergraduate students eligible to enter uh, both of these graduate programs, there was also something called a Bell Labs Summer Research Program for Minorities and Women, which was established in 1974. This was a 10 week summer program for outstanding underrepresented minorities and women who have completed their junior year of undergraduate studies. The purpose of the SRP was to provide a preview of the lifestyle of a research and R&D career, research and development career, and to impact decisions to earn graduate degrees. So one of the first people that I met in 1974 for the summer research program was Alice White, who was an undergraduate then. Uh, and she uh, was a junior and a senior uh, at years of college and spent time at, uh, at the summer research program. And so she, she participated in the program, again, which began in 1974. Alice eventually received her PhD. She became one of the early GRPW fellows and eventually was hired at Bell Labs and became chief scientist at Bell Labs, uh, and which was then which then became Bell Labs Alcatel Lucent. So Dr. White was awarded the seven, 1976 GRPW Fellowship to pursue a PhD in physics at Harvard, uh, and her Bell Labs mentor was Doug Osheroff, who went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1996. And today, uh, Alice White is a professor uh, at Boston University. And this is my photo from 1974. This again was the first year of the Bell Lab Summer Research Program. And there I am with my mentor, David Austin, and working on a very large neodymium glass laser. Um, and this laser was, uh, had put out so much power that you had to actually take one shot per minute. And basically we yelled throughout the lab, fire in the hole when we were about to take a shot in whatever experiments. And these were some of the optical components that I learned uh, on the job and that summer of 1974. And so with this summer research program, I had the opportunity to work in two areas, lasers and picosecond optoelectronics with Dave Austin, who eventually went on to become the provost at Rice and president of the Kavli Institute at UC Santa Barbara, and, or Bob Dines, another very well-known physicist uh, in the area of low temperature physics and superconductivity. <coughs> Bob Dines is a past president of UC San Diego. Yeah, and so I chose lasers. And this was the, is this summer experience that made me decide to go into optics and photonics. I had such a great uh, summer research experience and worked with my advisor and eventually asked him to be my co-PhD thesis advisor um, uh, a little bit later on. But this is how, uh, what I would suggest for all of you is to get an opportunity to do a summer internship. Because with that, you will learn not only what you enjoy, but what you don't want to do. And so this experience, even though I knew I wanted to do physics, this is this summer research experience made it possible for me to, um, uh, I don't know what, going on here. Oh, it was with that that I decided to go into optics and photonics, lasers. Something just happened to my screen. Okay. So, 
That experience was so rewarding. Um, that first summer at Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey, and I learned about lasers and uh, uh, photoconductivity and things of that nature. And my advisor urged me to write this down, write down my experience, and I actually wrote a bachelor's thesis, but we also published a paper and he permitted me to be first author. This is my first technical um, paper and I was uh, a junior in undergraduate school and uh, in the IEEE Journal of Quantum Electronics and it was published in 1975. And so, that gives you an idea of how rewarding that experience was for me to actually publish my first technical paper. Okay, so Bell Labs, the fellowship program. AT&T can claim that 22% of all minorities who have earned PhDs in electrical engineering in the past 20 years have been part of a program the company sponsored. AT&T has helped 67 students earn PhDs by paying their graduate tuition, giving them an annual stipend and summer employment and setting them up with a mentor. That was a very critical point. This was published in Science Magazine in 1992, which is, which is the 20th anniversary of the fellowship program. Bell Labs established and maintained a strong program that added significantly to the pool of underrepresented minorities in the nation's scientific and engineering workforce. Uh, nationwide in 1981, four PhDs were awarded to African-Americans in physics. Two of the four were Bell Labs CRP fellows. I was one of them. I was one of four PhDs in physics to African-Americans. By 1991, 10% of the PhDs awarded to underrepresented minorities in engineering went to the Bell Labs Fellows. And since then, the program has produced well over 100 underrepresented minority PhDs over its lifetime. Unfortunately, the program has been terminated uh, despite the success. So the impact of the summer internship for me. With that summer ex in, uh, intern experience, I decided I wanted to pursue a PhD in physics. I got to see what research was really like when I was at Bell Labs in Murray Hill that summer. I wanted to become a member of technical staff and research at Bell Labs. The summer intern mentor was David Austin. He became my thesis, PhD thesis co-advisor. And since Bell Labs can't give me a PhD, my co-advisor was Robert R. Alfano at the City College of New York in the physics department. So my thesis research was very unique in that I actually performed it at Bell Labs instead of at the university. So in Dave, Dave Austin's lab. Now, this is something I'm not proud of, but I, uh, I was so enamored, so smitten by Bell Labs that when it was time for me to get a position, I actually turned down an interview at IBM Yorktown Heights. Not a good move, not smart at all. I, mean, I could have at least gone, but I was so determined that Bell Labs was the only thing that I wanted. So I got job offers eventually from Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey, and in Homedale, New Jersey. Those are the two main research labs of AT&T Bell Labs at the time. So despite a warm and fantastic relationship with my advisor, I decided that distance was necessary to establish my own reputation because I knew that I would forever be Dave Austin's student. And I needed to move in order to establish my own research credentials. And so I decided to accept the position at Homedale with um, department head Charles V. Shank, another well-known optics person. 
And this worked out. And Dave Austin and I are very good friends and colleagues to this day. So I, I just I think that was a, my a very good decision because I've heard of students uh, working too closely with their advisors never got separated. And so that was important for me. So I did become a, a member of technical staff in Homedale in 1981. That was one of my dreams and that happened. And I was one of very few black physicists in research. Uh, and I will say that I know that this was a diversity affirmative action program. And I'm proud of the fact that I was a member of that. All I was looking for was a level playing field to show what I could watch do. The talk. And so these programs got no, me in the door. <laughs> and that's all I wanted was to get in the door. Man, no we no do other see. special privileges other than that. Just an opportunity to show. Um, being a member of staff at Bell, because I quote in quotes, knew the system and what was necessary to succeed. I think spending time there really helped me. None of my colleagues that uh, were in the fellowship program that went on to, to Bell Labs ended up leaving. And so one expression that I came up with is that isolation is equivalent to death in research. And what I mean by that is if one has to uh, be able to uh, work with your colleagues in these labs, especially places like Bell Laboratories, which, uh, which was very tough. So I took the initiative because I knew the system, the setting up meetings with colleagues to discuss research and the unique skills that I could bring to the table. So when I arrived at uh, Homedell, I actually went around to my colleagues there and actually talked about what I could do to advance their research with my, with my experiences in optics and photonics. And uh, uh, lo and behold, many collaborations started. But it was up to me to make that move. And that, so, I'm going, and so I'm saying to you, you cannot be shy about this and you cannot isolate yourself because you will not last in this cutthroat and competitive environment. So these interactions break down barriers and force this collaboration. It really did for me. Um, and I had mentors that probably never knew they were important mentors to my career and survival at Bell Labs. And I spent nearly 15 years in research at Bell and I can say that those were the best times in my career. I've got, I was able to do some um, important science published and I made, made uh, friends and colleagues at the labs and so forth as a result. So one has to look out for oneself and let people know what you can and can't do. So here was one of my colleagues, um, Deborah Jackson, we were both Bell Labs fellows, and this was one of our first meetings in 1981. That's the year I got my PhD. We had the first meeting of the National Society of Black Physicists meeting. And Deborah was a, was a year ahead of me. She did her PhD at Stanford with uh, Nobel Prize winner, Art Shallow. And she gave a talk there. And this was probably my first talk. Um, and I talked about my thesis work at Bell Labs. And this was at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory or Fermilab, and where I gave my, my talk on May 1st, 1981. And this is a photo that um, also in 1981, this was a conference called the Gordon Research Conference. And this was a conference on lasers and nonlinear optics. 
everybody, um, all the major figures in optics and lasers and nonlinear optics were at this conference, uh, including several Nobel Prize winners. And I can immediately see right here, this is Nico Bloombergen, uh, received a, uh, from Harvard, who received the Nobel Prize in physics. Um, and so my advisor, Dave Austin, right here, was the chair of the conference and made sure that I got there. And so there I am <laughs> in the crowd. And here's Deborah Jackson, uh, also in this crowd. And we were th the only two African-American physicists in this, in this crowd, but we got to meet everybody that was um, uh, prominent in the field of lasers and nonlinear optics. So this was a very important milestone meeting. Now, some of the things, uh, I was a member of the American Physical Society, APS. And one of the things I uh, did was I became chair of the Committee on Minorities in Physics. And the APS has a newsletter called the APS News. And in 1992, when I was chair of the committee, I wrote a, an article and one of the things that, I, um, that came out was this quote from me, I think it's critical that the stereotype that minorities can't do physics be challenged. And so that was one of the things that I wanted to, to make sure. This is a reunion, uh, the 20th reunion of the Bell Labs Fellows. And here we are at Bell Labs in Murray Hill I was a member of staff at the time, so that's me and this Deborah again, and a number of other prominent uh, uh, folks that went through the fellowship program. And last night I met one of the teachers who asked about Martin Feldman. Now this is the Martin Feldman I knew from Bell Labs and it might be the one that she referred to. And um, this is uh, Jim West who was one of the uh, early physicists at Bell Labs who really instigated and, and pushed to have this fellowship program at Bell Labs. And Jim is uh, the co-inventor of the Electret microphone, which they invented at Bell Labs. And this microphone was in every telephone in the nation. And so he's in the Inventors Hall of Fame and uh, very well known uh, acoustic physicist. So let me talk about some observations and lessons learned over the years. Though I initially, though initially I was skeptical of the concept of a role model, when I left AT&T Bell Labs to join NJIT, the New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark, New Jersey, as the chair of the department, I discovered that I attracted underrepresented minorities to my research group in a department that had no such students before my arrival. My second PhD student, Dr. Elaine Lalane, was the only African-American woman to receive a PhD in physics in 2003. I now believe that this concept of a role model works for both foreign and domestic students, and of course, women. It is therefore imperative to increase the number of underrepresented minority and women faculty to have an impact upon the diversity of STEM graduate students. Due to a typically subcritical mass of underrepresented minority and women students, a supportive and nurturing environment is usually very important for retention. I have found that underrepresented minority and women students gravitate towards research groups led by underrepresented minorities and women. And I'm very fortunate to have a nearly 100% retention rate in my own research group. Now here's a, a photo of my first three graduate students uh, in my lab at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, this is Hernando Garcia, who was my first uh, PhD student. 
Elaine Lalane, my second, and my third, Ferdinand O'Gramer. They all have PhDs and are practicing physicists, all doing research in optics and photonics. Very proud of this, of this group. And it got, kind of got me started in academia. In 2005, I had a very unique opportunity to take part in a very well-known laser conference called CLEO, Conference on Lasers and Electro-Optics. And this was held at the Baltimore Convention Center. And some friends and colleagues at Spectra Physics, which is a major laser supplier, asked if I would be willing to be on the exhibit floor for Clio in 2005 and actually put a real experiment on the exhibit floor. And so what we have here is a, um, is a, a technique that we developed for measuring nonlinearities and optical fibers. And so it's encased in here. And this was one of the spectrophysics lasers that we used to actually make the measurements. So here I have Robinson Quis, um, who received the PhD from, well, they all did. Robinson Quis, um, Raymond Edzier, and Elaine Lalane, uh, all PhDs with me. And we put this together and proudly displayed it at Clio in 2005. Now, uh, my group also was part of a NSF, National Science Foundation, engineering research, um, uh, engineering research center called MIRTH, Mid Infrared Technologies for Health and the Environment. And uh, this was done with my also Bell Labs uh, uh, collaborator, Claire Gamakel at Princeton. She was the PI on the grant, and I was the uh, uh, research uh, uh, co-PI on the grant. And so here, one of our collaborators was uh, Professor Carl Unterreiner at, in Vienna, Vienna University. And Elaine um, spent three, three months at Vienna uh, doing research on some novel materials that Carl Unterreiner had. And the interesting thing is that Elaine was able to hit the ground running because this tsunami titanium dope sapphire laser is exactly the laser she did her PhD thesis on with me. And so she was really able to get started and produce some really novel results with her three months stay at, um, in Vienna. And here was a dinner party that they, the group with Carl Unterreiner and his research group did, um, had for Elaine during her three months there in Vienna. Now, what a funny thing that Elaine told me is that the, she had a wonderful time, but the one thing that she did, wasn't able to do was she was worried about black hair products. She couldn't find any in Vienna. And so uh, that was always amusing that that was the, her main problem is it was, was finding black hair care products in Vienna. So this is another photo that I'm very happy about. And um, this is a group of, um, of past and present presidents of the Optical Society of America now called Optica. Uh, and um, proud member of that group. I was elected president um, of the OSA in 2002. Now, I did, it took me two attempts. I, uh, I did a first run, I was nominated, and I didn't win. And of course, that I was, I vowed I would not run again, but there were colleagues on the board of uh, OSA that really pushed me to, to try one more time. And the second time that I ran, I did win. And so I, I was president in 2002. And this was a picture at the annual meeting of the Optical Society in 2000, 2006 at the University of Rochester. Uh, and so 
So these are some of my colleagues. Some of them were Bell Labs. Um, Herbert Kogelnik was my director at one point at Bell. And Rod Alphanis was my department head at one point at Bell Labs and all uh, presidents as well. So another thing that I got to do was um, some work what we call hand uh, um, HH000 project funding. And this was hands-on optics. And this was a grant for $1.7 million from the National Science Foundation from the Division of Informal Science. And what was interesting about this was that um, was trying to coordinate two large optical societies, each with 20,000 members or so, the OSA and the SPIE. And so uh, what basically we did a joint project in which I was the PI on the grant and the co-PI was Eugene Authors, which was the executive director of SPIE. And this, so this was a program in which we developed kits and we would go into middle schools on Saturday on Saturdays and actually introduce the students to optics with real lasers uh, to, to get them interested in optics and photonics. And so here's a photo. This is the executive director of the OSA. This is Elizabeth Rogan. And this is Eugene Authors of the SPIE. And one of the things that the National Science Foundation really um, applauded us for was getting these two societies to work together. And, and so in this case, we had, the, um, we had members from both societies, which would be about a total of 40,000 members to work together to push this idea of bringing optics to middle schools. That was a very successful program. Now, this is a, I, I just love this program. This is a neat photo. This is um, my former student, Raymond Edzia, who went on to get his PhD. He is now on the faculty at the University of Cape Coast in Cape Coast, Ghana. And here he's working on one of our uh, neodymium vanadate lasers, frequency doubled to the green. And um, I, I always just thought this was a neat program, uh, uh, a photo with him in it. And then I have this another photo of a, another student, Victor Torres, who did a PhD with me, working on his PhD with me part-time. He was a full-time NASA Goddard employee. And one of the things that all of my students have to do if they're gonna do research with me is build what we call an autocorrelator. And that is to measure the pulse duration of these, uh, of these pulses from this laser. And they were on the order of seven picoseconds. I'll say a little bit more about what a picosecond is toward the end of the talk. But there's no electronics that can measure anything that fast. So you have to use light to measure light. And so one builds a setup so that one can make these measurements. And here is Victor making uh, such a device in my training lab. I actually have a, my main research lab and then a training lab where students can go in and make mistakes if, if, if they happen before going into the main research lab. So this is one thing I'm really glad that I have so that I can teach students about optics and photonics. And on, another student, Robinson Quise, who I met at NGIT before I moved to uh, UMBC. And he joined, he was a McNair scholar and he joined my group uh, to pursue a PhD in applied physics at NGIT. But then I moved to UMBC and he actually moved with me and helped me build my Casper Research Lab, Center for Advanced Studies in Photonics Research. And Rob uh, is one of the typical 10 to 15 Latino Americans in the US receiving a PhD in 2009. Now here's a picture of a joint meeting. This is in 2011 in Austin, Texas of the joint conference of the National Society of Black Physicists 
and the National Society of Hispanic Physicists. And so we can see we've got quite a few folks here. And this was a technical conference of, of which many have occurred. And here is in 2011, uh, my colleague, Peter Delfiat from uh, the University of Central Florida and, and I, and we, were, we were, were given funding from the OSA and the SPIE to actually fund the top optics and photonics posters that were presented by these uh, young students at the conference. And we did this for five years where we would do the judging and hand out certificates and checks for best performance. So that was a nice labor. Another thing was I was asked by the Optical Society to be a co-editor in a for a column for the magazine of the Optical Society. This is called Optics and Photonics News Magazine. And I did this with my colleague, Ursula Keller. We were both at Bell Labs in Homedale, both doing short pulse lasers. And this was an idea to promote diversity in optics and write and invite people to, to, to submit inf uh, work on columns that would um, highlight diversity in the optics community. So I, I wrote one of these columns myself in March of 2012, and I have a few um, pieces from it. So this was called, I, I entitled it Minority Women Scientists at the Culture Gender Crosswords. Now, this was in 2012. But it relates to an experience I had in 1992 when I was chair of the committee on, of the APS Committee on Minorities. So I write, I learned about a unique cultural issue among Hispanic women when I chaired the APS Committee on Minorities and Physics. As part of the APS site visit program, we visited the University of Texas, El Paso, or UTEP in 1992. At that time, UTEP had a Hispanic population of nearly 60%, giving it the potential to graduate the largest number of Spanish speaking PhDs in physics in the United States. So we had a group and this was something that we, uh, the APS does is we go as a group, the committee to various universities and we basically look at the physics department and uh, we talk to the chair, the deans, and, and, and in some cases, the provosts about how the program is doing. And so we learn certain things about the program when we make these site visits. And we usually, usually we're asked to come and do the site visit. So here's a statement. However, during the student discussion sessions, I noticed that elder Hispanic family members and sometimes husbands or brothers were inherently suspicious of the academic curriculum, which required students to, to work beyond standard daylight hours. Apparently it was considered shameful for young women to be out after hours. It did not matter that these fledgling scientists were involved in their requisite academic activities. In other words, using the libraries, the laboratories, and the research facilities at all hours. That's typical. These culture-specific misgivings were so pervasive that many female students could not pursue science careers, even though I recommended an orientation program for the families. I had hoped to help eliminate any misunderstandings that could erode support for these young women. Unfortunately, the disapproving attitudes nevertheless affected these young women, dissuading them from choosing a science curriculum. So this, now this again, this is, um, this was a, a quite a while ago and I hope that has changed, but this was clearly evident when um, my committee, my APS committee visited UTEP. And so I decided to, to write an article about that in Optics and Photonics News. Then there was the APS, American Physical Society Bridge Program. And I was uh, chair of the National Advisory Board. <clears throat> the goals of the APS Bridge Program, 
APSBP, are to increase within a decade the number of physics PhDs awarded to underrepresented ethnic and racial minorities or URMs to match the fraction of physics bachelor's degrees granted to these groups. Remarkably, this can be accomplished with 30 additional URM PhDs per year. The APS Bridge Program also aims to develop, evaluate, and document sustainable models that improve the access to and culture of graduate education for all students with emphasis on URM's doctoral programs in physics. So now this is the case of one particular student. One student in our program represents a case in point. She reported that she was unable to gain admission to graduate school because of a low undergraduate grade point average. But once fully supported in a PhD program, through an application to the uh, bridge program, she excelled at the coursework. Although she had received Bs or lower in her core undergraduate physics courses, she earned As and in the graduate level versions of the same course. What accounts for this difference? She had to work several jobs <coughs> as an undergraduate to put herself through college and lacked the time to study properly. <coughs> and this happens quite a bit, excuse me. And so this is but one example of a URM student that would not be in graduate school today <coughs> without this program. And this was reported in the magazine of the APS, American Physical Society, Physics Today in 2017. <coughs> I'm sorry about that. Recola. Now, <coughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> the bridge programs were um, rarely important programs. <coughs> and here is a photo taken and written in um, Physics Today in March of 2011. And there I am at UMBC with two of my physics graduates, Dr. Robertson Quis, and this is Shelley Watts who received a master's degree, and this is an article written in Physics Today about us. And then my uh, my other student, Dr. Elaine Lane, uh, has this quote for, from the article: "I wish there was a promise when I was in graduate school." This is a program at UMBC. Um, that really works with the graduate students uh, <clears throat> to help them along. Uh, so Dr. Elaine Lane is um, a part of my, my uh, Center for Advanced Studies of Photonics Research and the first African-American woman to obtain a PhD in physics from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, Lane's advice to minority students facing challenges in completing their PhD, don't isolate yourself. Seek out support mechanisms like Promise. Go to conferences. Seek help even on the internet. There is light at the end of the tunnel. <clears throat> now, there's another uh, group at APS uh, called the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics. And so they had a newsletter called the Gazette <clears throat> and I wanted to point out a quote from 
uh, from the Gazette in 1992. Quote, I see no reason for a committee on women in physics. There are only two women in physics, and I know them both, and they are both very happy. How short-sighted can somebody be <clears throat> and actually get this in print? Uh, um, about uh, saying something like that. And so I have a couple of other provocative quotes on diversity. The fundamental problem, the panel notes, and this is from the National Academies, uh, the panel notes is not attracting women into science, but retaining them once they are trained. It is not the lack of talent but unintentional biases and our outmoded institutional structures that are hindering the access and the advancement of women. Women from minority, racial, and ethnic backgrounds are virtually absent from the nation's leading science and engineering departments. And so this was written in the magazine Science in 2006, uh, talking about the status of women in academic science <clears throat> and engineering. And here's another quote from another conference. This is the physics, the annual meeting of the physics department chairs conference in, Ju in June of 2012. And I quote, as a white male, I will never know what it's like to be an underrepresented minority. He also noted that a lot of people are simply not interested in diversity. They are not necessarily openly hostile, but they are not interested in doing anything either. And this is that uh, quote from 1992. I see no reason for a committee on women in physics. There are only two women in physics. I know both, and they are very happy. It's unbelievable. Okay. Now, as president, when well, I was president of the Optical Society in 2002, I had to write, I was tasked to write a column every month in optics and photonics news. And so um, <clears throat> in my first column, uh, this is a, a small excerpt from that. I remember that first committee assignment very well because it had an ignominious beginning for me. At the time, I was one of a very small number of African-American optics researchers. During my first committee meeting, Another committee member assumed I was in the room to serve coffee. There's no way I could be a committee member. There are a number of ways that I might have reacted to this, but I'm muted. Okay. Like so. So, is this the hint? Is this the hint that you want me to cut, to finish? <laughs> oh. I don't know why that went off. No, well, that's still in. Who's the mouse?
Oh, it was muted. But am I muted? Am I muted? Because it, it went, it. No, you, the lapel is listed. Okay. But you're not muted on the Okay. 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 So I think we're back. All right, I think we're back and I can continue. Thank you. So as I had mentioned, <clears throat> one of my very first professional committee assignments was with um, the Optical Society and I had my first meeting and someone, another committee member, who I didn't know, uh, wanted to know when I was going to serve him coffee. And I was, of course, um, just shocked to hear that and, and basically told him, well, I'm a member of this committee as well. And, and so my remark, my, my thoughts on this was that I owed this individual a debt of gratitude because the incident made me resolve to be a strong contributing member of the optics com community. I, I'm not saying that I appreciated the very insulting remark, but it ignited in me a passion for excellent science and service. Um, and so since then, uh, the OSA has become a more inclusive and diverse organization, such that we are foremost among scientific societies in our efforts to reach out to women and minorities. <clears throat> and then I had the pleasure to attend a very lively women in the OSA session at our annual meeting. This is a picture of my research group. This was a couple of years ago. Uh, but showing indeed how diverse we are and, and, and I always look at my group as family members and we are still in touch with each other uh, and so forth. Now, this is something that I think I mentioned, Elizabeth Rogan, who is the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Optical Society or Optica. And to my surprise, uh, in January of 2022, she posted this um, on the website. Anthony Johnson was the optical board president who hired me in 2002 in my current role as CEO. He, support, he supported hiring a woman without the desired PhD degree to run a science and engineering society. Anthony knew I'd have to navigate protests from individuals in our community who would have sufficient, who would have difficulty accepting me in this role. <clears throat> he courageously and actively advocated for me, which gave me the confidence I needed to do the job precisely 20 years ago. Thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> and so she cited this on the optical website. And I was, of course, very honored to, to be a part of that. And one of my legacies was actually hiring Liz Rogan as the CEO of Optica. And then another colleague, I also, Ursula Keller, we spent time together uh, at Bell Labs in Homedale. And she is now a professor at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Um, and she does ultrafast lasers. Just this, I'll just read this small portion. 
I was hired in 1993 into a woman position, sometimes termed a quota woman. <clears throat> Hesitating to sec accept such an offer, I turned to Dr. Anthony Johnson, one of the few African-American scientists at Bell Labs, to ask his advice. Understanding the issues much better than I did at the time, he advised me to take the job and make sure to use the opportunity to show that you can do it. You want a level playing field. You need to give, be given the opportunity to show your stuff. 30 years later, I continue to give the same recommendation to upcoming women in STEM. And so <clears throat> I was very proud to see this from my uh, colleague and friend, Ursula Keller. Okay, just a little bit of physics before I end. My research is in the field of ultra-fast optical phenomena. Now, we know from our physics classes that distance is equal to velocity times time. For electromagnetic radiation, we have Einstein's special theory of relativity, which says that all electromagnetic radiation, light, travels at a constant speed of the speed of light, C. And C, the speed of light, is 186,000 miles per second, or three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So equating distance and time gives you a feel for what time is. <clears throat> so it would take a pulse of light, one picosecond, to travel a third of a millimeter, 0.33 millimeters. And one picosecond is one trillionth of a second or 10 to the minus 12 seconds. This is a very short, a brief instant in time, but many processes work on that time scale. And those are some of the processes that I do my research in. <clears throat> now, a thousand times shorter than that is a femtosecond, which is a quadrillionth of a second or 10 to the minus 15 seconds. It would take that pulse one femtosecond to travel a third of a micron. So another way to get a sense for these time scales, one femtoseconds can be written as this, 10 to minus 15 seconds, but the distance between the earth and the moon is about 250,000 miles. It would take a pulse approximately 1.3 seconds to travel the distance between the earth and the moon, the pulse of light <clears throat> with C given by that. A hair follicle is typically on the order of 100 microns in diameter. <coughs> it would take 330 femtoseconds to travel that distance. And at this time, six femtoseconds was the shortest pulse that one could obtain in the visible. And that would have a spatial extent of 1.8 microns. Now here are some famous photos by Harold Egerton from MIT, who used something called strobe photography, which had, which had a exposure time of about one microsecond. Okay, one millionth of a second. And here's a famous milk drop experiment Here's a photo capturing a bullet, piercing a photograph, and something that he would call applesauce, of a bullet penetrating an apple and catching that. And so these are some of the fastest um, photographs, but these are small compared to what we can do now in making measurements <coughs> on these incredible short time scales. Here is um, another, uh, approach. Now, this is a fairly old article, but I think it, it uh, describes well what one can do with laser machining. <clears throat> so here we have a sheet of 100 micron thick steel foil, and we have two lasers, one with a very short pulse duration of 200 femtoseconds, and one with a much longer pulse duration of 3.3 nanoseconds. 
<clears throat> nanoseconds is a billionth of a second. And what happens is that when you send a very intense pulse of light uh, focused onto this, this um, steel foil, the energy is deposited quickly and the material is ejected <clears throat> in a process called ablation. And if you can get the energy in and remove the material faster than the material melts, then you get a nice clean drilled hole. <clears throat> With a pulse that's three nanoseconds, you now have time for the material to begin to melt. And so this is what we call collateral damage. And so the reason that three, three nanosecond pulse produces this very ugly hole is that during the process of the pulse entering and ablating the material, it actually began to melt. And so this is the melt front. <clears throat> so short pulses are necessary to do clean laser machining. Now, another thing that's uh, important is optical limiting. And so these, this is a uh, couple of slides put together from my colleague, Andy Mott at the Army Research Laboratory. <clears throat> and laser jamming is a commonly referred to as dazzle, which occurs when a system has been exposed to excessive intense light disrupting its, op its uh, operation. <clears throat> there is damage in which the laser beams are used to produce permanent malfunctions within the optical systems. And one that is a real problem recently is that people are using laser pointers to blind pilots. This is a cockpit of an airplane. <clears throat> and someone is shining a laser pointer at the um, pilot. <clears throat> and so even the off the shelf laser pointers can be harmful. My group is doing research in trying to find materials that we could coat this windshield with that would quickly absorb <clears throat> the materials, absorb the energy from the light. And we're typically using nanostructured materials to do that. So that's one of the research efforts in my group. <clears throat> and then there was uh, something that happened very interestingly and very fortuitously. <clears throat> A colleague of mine in the mechanical engineering department, her name was uh, Professor Liang Zhu. She's an expert in thermal management and that is handling heat. <clears throat> and her interest in was in actually using uh, microwaves to destroy prostate cancer tumors in mice. So she would basically uh, uh, direct microwaves into a tumor. If you could raise the temperature of a prostate cancer tumor by about 20 to 25 degrees C, it would begin to die, the tumor, okay? <clears throat> but then she said, thought about, is there a way to do this even more locally? In other words, using a laser system. And so she got on the UMBC website and looked for someone that had laser experience or laser group and came upon my group, CASPER, Center for Advanced Studies in Photonics Research. I didn't even know Liang. And so this is one of those accidents that happens. And she called and wanted to know if I was interested in trying to use my <clears throat> titanium dope sapphire laser to do the equivalent of what the microwaves were doing in a mouse with prostate cancer. And so I said, absolutely. I always wanted to do some biophysics, but never had the opportunity. So here we have my one picosecond Thai sapphire laser. We did a beam expander and then a periscope. And here we would have the mouse on an optical table. We had to build this because of the medical protocols. No one in my group was allowed to, to touch the mouse. Only she could, or her graduate students <clears throat> could do that. And so what we have is this picture. Now, my, my graduate students were a little squeamish at first of having a mouse on the, on the optical table. This is called a nude mouse because the hair is removed. So here's the mouse before laser treatment. And here we have circles here is where prostate cancer was actually injected into the mouse. And 
Uh, but also injected into the mouse was what we'd hoped would be the cure. And that was gold nanorods, <clears throat> about one nanometer in dimension and, uh, and the shape that would actually absorb red light. Now, recall when you go to a doctor and they put this uh, device on your finger that has this red light. That light is being absorbed through your skin and detecting the amount of oxygen uh, in, your, uh, in your system. So we already know that our skin, which is very similar to that of the mouse, that red light can actually penetrate through the skin surface. And so that was the idea of actually having a mouse with the prostate cancer in it and injecting the gold nanorods. And so the gold nanorods would absorb the red light from the laser and raise the temperature of that, the near that tumor. <clears throat> and we raised it so that it would be more than 20, 25 degrees C. So here is before laser treatment and here's after. So what we show here is the prostate cancer tumor that we injected also the gold nanorods and then we illuminated it. And then after 25 days, you can see that the tumor completely disappeared. Whereas in the control, where we did not have nanorods, the tumor continued to grow. And so we showed that one could do this uh, by using short pulses of light, and which meant that we also did not damage the mouse. There, there was no heating or anything like that. And so this mouse, was alive during the whole process. I was just anesthetized, so I didn't run all over the place. But um, we, we did our experiment and then came back 25 days later to see the differences. And we published that in the International Journal of Biomedical Engineering and Technology. So this was our first biophysics uh, experiment. And uh, we had very exciting results uh, after that, we actually got some NSF funding, National Science Foundation, to go on ahead. Okay. And then finally, I have something that I really enjoy, and that is uh, I have middle school students come to my lab, and I show them about optics and photonics. And here we're looking at fibers, coupling light in and out of the fibers and some of the things we do with that. <clears throat> and then a more recent photo of my main research lab with two of my students um, that have, uh, this is Paul Birkins who got his PhD with me and Isaac Basaldroa who is Peruvian American and will be finishing up this year. And I'm just kind of watching in the background. Uh, and so this is my last Slide. So, is that a pause because I'm finishing or because you enjoyed what I had to say? <laughs> <clears throat> so, my remark is this. This is a cartoon that I clipped from the Sunday New York Times 30, 30 years ago. This is 1994, 30 years ago. And unfortunately, this cartoon is still relevant. So here what we have is Joe Smith, our resident black person, and one of his coworkers saying, so how come you people are still so angry. And unfortunately, this is still relevant today, definitely in the scientific field. And so I will end with that. Yeah, I'm done.
Okay. All right, so I want to take the time out to thank um, Dr. Anthony. But before we do that, I would like to open this up as a chance because this is what our program is mostly geared towards, allowing for the community to be able to communicate with elite scientists. So at this time, I would like to be able to open the floor up for any students that would like to ask any questions about anything that you've heard today about the career path, anything of, um, of the science that you've, that you've heard today. So there are um, mics that are on the floor. And if you have a question, you may um, walk down the aisle in the center and someone will meet you with the, with the phone, microphone. Any questions you may have at this time? Don't be shy. Okay. Okay, yeah. So you said like you injected mice with prostate cancer. So like, where did that come from? I I didn't hear the question. So the prostate cancer from like that you injected the mice with. So like, where did that come from? Oh, that was a strain that uh, that many of the uh, biophysicists and uh, biomedical folks have um, on site at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, at UMBC. So they actually had that and could inject it into the mouse, all right? So I, that's not something that I was allowed to touch. So they brought the mouse to the lab and we did the experiment. Okay. But, but they had access to the prostate cancer. Thank you. <clears throat> Stop. Anyone else? One more question here. Over here. Over here. So that injection for the prostate cancer has only been tried in, in mice. It hadn't been tried in humans or anything yet, right? That, that we tried in humans? It's, a, it's only been tried in mice. It hadn't been tested in humans or anything yet, right? Well, we were, were, were just, the, the idea in this case was to, to test whether or not the process would even work at all with lasers. And so we already knew that with nanostructured materials, that if you shape them appropriately, you can actually tune where the resonance is and, absorb, and have high absorption. So these were shaped, the nanorods, to absorb 800 nanometer light. And so that was injected into the tumor and then we shone the light on it and it raised the temperature by about 25 degrees C and that's what killed the prostate cancer. That was pretty successful, right? Yes. So are they thinking about doing it with humans? Well, we've thought about, that's a much tougher process of trying to get uh, the tumor to a point where we can actually excite it. See, in a mouse, that's very easy to do. You know, you saw my uh, experimental setup, but there are some experiments going on where we're trying to uh, bring in optical fibers into uh, uh, mice and other things that might actually work with humans uh, the, to transport the light through an optical fiber that's, that's inserted into uh, the patient. Thank you very much. That's some very interesting stuff compared to the very interesting, all of it. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> do you sorry, do you have any like long term effects with your vision like damage due to working with lasers do we worry about damage <clears throat> like are your eyes damaged because of working with those lasers well no as you see in some of the uh, some of the cases that we do wear optical uh, goggles that attenuate the light so we are very careful about looking at um, uh, making sure we know where reflections are and so forth because all of that light can be harmful if it gets into your eyes so no we're very cognizant of that um, when we're doing these experiments. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Oh. 
right. All right. All right. All right. All right. First, I got a question. So any point in time with this career, did you want to just stop, just wanted to switch it because it was too hard, the studying was hard, and you didn't think you was going to make it? Could, could you repeat that? Sorry. All right, I got you. <clears throat> so any time in your career, any point, did you ever think that you wanted to switch careers because it ended up being too hard or it just wasn't working out? No, I was very fortunate to have wonderful mentors that encouraged me to go forward and did not, one of the things that, that, that I tried to do and with my group, which I think I learned from my own mentor, was that mistakes happen, you know, and that you can go in and, and, and accidentally damage a piece of optical equipment. Well, hopefully you learn from that and then you continue on. But I encourage all my students to go in the lab to be able to tear down an experiment and build it back up. There are some that have black box type of experiments where you never, you never get to open it. I insist that my students know how these lasers work and, and feel comfortable opening the box and going in and making some tweaks here and there and if they and if they turn and if and this has happened, misalign the laser so it doesn't work. Now it's up to you to get it back online, and that's a, that's a learning process. So I must say that I've I've gone through different parts of uh, my research and learning new things, and that's been fun actually. But no, I've never been discouraged, and I would do it all over again. All right. Thank you for the presentation. And can we get one more round of applause? Clap it up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yeah. All right. Before we have, before we take our next question, just a second. Before we take our next question, I would like for you guys to please be respectful of the people that are asking questions so the speaker may be able to hear and for this, when the speaker is speaking to be respectful and keep your volumes at a level zero so that when the speaker is speaking, we can hear. This is a chance for some people to be able to ask questions that they've been burning to ask for a lifetime. So please don't take away their moment to be able to do that and for them to hear the responses. Thank you. You wanna ask your question now? Are there any more questions? Yeah. I don't want to. Can somebody bring her a mic? There's someone right here. We have a question over here. Oh. Huh? <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Um, did your family like support your physicist journey? Did my family support it? Yeah. Well, my family did. Um, I have uh, two brothers, and I was the only one that actually pursued a career in science and engineering. Um, it turns out that my family in Brooklyn uh, was a um, transit family. My father, my uncle, my two brothers all worked for the MTA, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, either driving buses or subways. And I always thought to myself, since if I never, if I did not pass my PhD qualifying exam in physics, I would drive a bus. So I, fortunately, I didn't have to do that. And, but my family greatly supported me. I mean, I was a little different, but they supported me. And so did my friends. I actually have some friends that I grew up with who actually looked out for me and supported my interest in science and in physics. And so I actually had that kind of uh, uh, support and I did everything that, you know, I went to parties and I played ball and I did all that stuff. I actually met my wife on the dance floor of a house party in Brooklyn. Good job. <laughs> so 
And I lived a normal life, but I also took my physics very seriously. That's amazing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Is that it? Oh. I was going to ask you um, why physics specifically? What made you really um, want to pursue physics in general? And what would you say to people pursuing science fields now? So, why was I interested in physics? Yes. Okay. I, I, I said at the beginning of my presentation that it was a, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, I went to Brooklyn high school, and it was a physics teacher that made physics exciting for me. If it probably, if it wasn't for him, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure which discipline I would have gone into. I knew I wanted to do science, but I didn't know which branch. I had physics, I, I had chemistry and biology and math, but it was physics that really got my interest. And, and of course, this science teacher really, took me under his wing and I, I ran with it. So I was fortunate to have someone, um, uh, a science teacher that took interest in me. And what would you say to someone who wanted to pursue science right now? Yes, absolutely wanted to pursue science. I knew that. And as I wrote in my um, um, yearbook, when I graduated from high school, I wanted to be a physicist because of my interaction with that science teacher. Science teachers are critical to getting people interested in these fields. Thank you. You're welcome. We. Someone down here? We have a question here. Uh, maybe the last question. <laughs> and we have one more down here and then we're gonna take that, make this the last one right here. So one there in here. Okay. Um, hey, I wanted to ask, like, how was your, like, coming up studying in this field, how was your mental knowing that you were one of the, like, Black people working, studying in this field? Like, how, how was your mental? How was it being, you mean being isolated in some cases? Well, um, I kind of knew that that was the case. I kind of grew a thick skin and dealt with it. And also knew that, um, like for example, when I went to, when I finished my PhD and went to Bell Labs in Homedale, I wasn't really welcomed uh, when I went there and had to start building my lab. But I knew that the science, the language of science and uh, would actually draw people to me. So I had to take it upon myself to actually visit my colleagues and tell them what kind of, of uh, research that I could bring to them. So for example, I had a colleague who worked on materials. I had laser experiments. I had specific kind of laser experiments with short pulse lasers. We sat down and we, and we planned an experiment. We did it, we published it. And so that got me to the, for the other members of the staff to actually realize that, yeah, I, I, I could do this. I deserve to be there. I, all I ever wanted was an even playing field. And I got that and thrived. And so some of my best colleagues are right there. And initially did not really want to work with me because they just thought I, I had gotten this prize and didn't deserve it. But once I could sit down with them and tell them, I know these techniques that you don't have access to, we can work together. That was what I think broke down all the barriers. And these people who at first were hesitant about working for me, working with me, became my colleagues. Thank you. You're welcome. Here. <clears throat> Here we have a, a student who wants to know more about uh, what happened or what. Um... I just, um, 
Um, uh, um, I just want to know more information about Alice White and Dr. Elena. What about them? Yes. Well, uh, Alice White is now a professor at Boston University. And uh, we're still in contact, of course, after all these years. But she went through the ranks at Bell Labs and she became uh, chief scientist. But then she left and went to university. Elaine is still a dear friend and colleague of mine. I just spoke to her two weeks ago. So she is now at NASA Goddard doing optics related research and we get together periodically. So these are long term relationships that I have with members of my group. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So thank you. So we've come to the end of our Q&A time. And so now it's time for door prizes. So, all right. Our first door prize that we have comes from um, the Louisiana Science Teachers Association, and they are encouraging the Quality Science and Mathematics Grant. This is a grant for Louisiana teachers to, um, to be able to get up to $2,000 of non-consumable materials for your classroom. So this is a great grant for those who are looking for money to be supply supplies for your classroom for teachers. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Johnson to pull. Okay. As Hollingsworth. As Hollingsworth. Can you come down? Is he not here? Ah, okay. Haley. Haley Blayton. Kent, oh, Ebony. Ebony, Ebony Lewis, CSAL. Are they here? I'm gonna put that there so I won't forget. <clears throat> Do we have Ebony Lewis from CSAL? Oh, they stepped out. Next person. That's a C-cell too. Oh. Another C-cell. Paul um, Panapinto, Pana I want to say that. All right, the next door prize that we have is from SLU. SLU is a space for everyone. This is a donation from them. And a little bit about um, SLU, it is a uh, um, Deliver Space Exploration Live. So it's an online telescope platform for full astronomy standards aligned curriculum for the K through 12 and higher ed. And this prize is going to be a book that is written with, um, that is that is the Saturn above, above it. It is a, um, a collection of short science fiction stories.
um, Davis from Geo Prep. I think it's is there someone? And one more. Mm -hmm. oh, they left. Yep. Ricky um, J. Simonin. <clears throat> one more all right so at this time i would like to take the time out at this time i would like to take the time out to thank you guys for coming out to our um, program i would like to thank dr anthony johnson for coming to speak to you guys and taking the time out of his um, busy schedule to um, speak to the youth i also would like to thank someone special in the audience for me because he talked about having mentors and for me going through mathematics and physics as an um, African-American female, it's important to have a great mentor. And one of my mentors is sitting in the audience now, Dr. Stephen McGuire. So I just wanna thank and appreciate him. He is the reason, he is the sole reason why I got involved with the LIGO project. As an undergrad, he pulled me to the side and said that this would be a great project for me. And little did he know that I would be in this position now. So having a great mentor really means a lot. So find you a great mentor to have um, that will um, support you in everything that you do. All right, I wanna tell you a little bit about um, our program. We offer different type of programs for LOPAD. One of our programs that we have are, are virtual field trips where we have um, do science demonstration and experiments for the classroom. This um, is free with science with swim, science with inexpensive materials. Another part of our program that we have um, if, to learn more about our program where we do in-person field trips, demonstrations for your classrooms, for STEM events or other organizations, you can always visit lopad.org. And it's, I would like to once again, thank you guys for coming and being a part of this program. And I look forward to being able to see your schools the next time we have an event. Um, when leaving, we're gonna give some uh, procedures when leaving. When leaving, you're gonna have exits from out of this door and this door. Um, please leave in an orderly fashion. And at this time, this is the end of our program. Thank you for coming out. Yeah.